begin. So tonight we conclude episode one of the book of Proverbs. So we are in the book of Proverbs. Episode one, and I do have to change my, turn my back, excuse me, is bad company and good counsel. So chapter one. Chapter two is perverted speech and loose sexuality. Chapter three, admonitions to holiness and arguments for wisdom. Chapter four, personal illustrations and practical advice. We've been all through these. Uh, bitter honey and sweet water, chapter 5. Social responsibility and family unit, chapter 7. Smooth coaxing, coaxings and deadly results. Ancient credentials, chapter 8, and contemporary callings. And tonight, two calls and two responses. So we've been talking about money. We've been talking about sexual, uh, sexual, advanta uh, sexual uh, advances from loose women. We've been talking about morals. We've been talking about wisdom and decision making. We've been talking all over the board. Solomon wants to give us a, uh, he wants to give us a, a prep on what's happening in our, in our lives, re, real lives. This is not something that just was good for Solomon's time. It's something, obviously, that is good for our time. So it's about pursuing wisdom. Uh, these are the episodes. Proverbs chapter 9 will bring us to that next step. And Proverbs chapter 9 gives us two calls and two reasons. So let me give you uh, two responses. Let me give you this. If I could tell you a little bit of an unrhyming rhyme. How many of you know rhymes don't all have to rhyme? If I can give you a little unrhyming rhyme. Proverbs chapter 1 is wisdom asks, who do you run with? They want to know, are you going to run with wisdom or are you going to run with the crowd? Are you going to be worldly or are you going to, be, are you going to listen to God's word? Uh, if you're going to make decisions every day. We make decisions every single day. Those small decisions we make uh, kind of mount up to a, to a, a lifestyle. Uh, eventually. And then Proverbs 2, your tongue belongs to wisdom's rule. Man, we don't have to talk too much about the tongue. I think it's self-evident that a lot of people get themselves in trouble with their tongue. Proverbs chapter 3, wisdom says holiness will set you free. What is holiness? Well, the word in the, in the Greek is the word hagios. And it means set aside for something, used for something. If this were a church, and it is kind of takes a church purpose. See that piano over there? You're never going to see that piano in a bar. It's, made, it's set aside for the church. It's set aside to be used for that. And so you and I are set aside to be used for God. And wisdom wants you to know that. They want you to know that you're not someone that's a product of the world. That's why when I tell you about it in the news, we are in the world, Jesus said, but we're not of the world. Even though we see that as the reality of our day, honestly, you're in a different kingdom. You're in a kingdom that is not affected by the kingdom of the world. Oh, I understand, I understand on the surface it is, but deep down, God is the one who takes care of you. Somebody say amen. Then we see chapter 4, will you walk through wisdom's door? It's your choice. You can walk through the door of wisdom, you can listen to what the Word says, or you can have your own ideas. There's a lot of people out there that have their own ideas. There's a lot of people out there that say, oh, that book is a compilation of a lot of people that it's not God's Word. Well, you're, you're welcome to say that. God allows you to say that. He allows critics to say that's not God's Word. So then you're left with your wisdom. And let me tell you something, I know my wisdom. My wisdom doesn't, it pales in comparison to God's wisdom. You need a source of truth. If you're your own source of truth, you are in a world of hurt. Because if you're your own source of truth and you follow your own ways, trust me, you will not be right all the time. <laughs> Brian told me about a guy that came back here. He was in here. I don't think he's there now, but he came in and he is there. What did he say, Brian? Let's tell him exactly what he said. He just came in here. Yeah, the guy said, so Brian was telling him, he was asking what was going on, you can finish, he was asking what was going on, and Brian told him that we're talking about in the news and prophecy, and the guy came back and he said, he said, uh, he thinks he has all the answers to me. Go ahead, tell him what you said. And that's exactly right. I don't have all the answers, the Bible has all the answers. And anyone who thinks they have all the answers is probably a fool. Come on, somebody say amen. All right, so chapter five, stay away from the bitter hive. Uh, chapter 6, that's, that's actually talking sexually. Uh, chapter 6, mischief and wisdom do not mix. Chapter 7, flattering lips won't take you to heaven. Again, a sexual reference. Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom created to make man great. We talked about money and finances in there. Proverbs chapter 9, both wisdom and folly say, come and dine. So that's what chapter 9 is about. Wisdom and folly are going to invite you to a meal. You're able to eat anyone you want. Matter of fact, I can tell you that every person on the planet is invited to one of those two meals. They're either invited to the meal of folly or they're invited to the meal of wisdom. And just because today you eat at the table of wisdom doesn't mean tomorrow you're going to eat at the table of wisdom. We have choices. We make every single day. So last week, uh, in chapter 8, we told you the most, the most yet about wisdom, how God created wisdom right before he created the universe and the world. Pretty powerful, what chapter 8 says. It's a, it really was an eye-opener for a lot of people. Wisdom was created. It says this, wisdom cries out to fools and it's a simple, and a simple Proverbs 8, 1-11, wisdom promises many gifts. Wisdom helped create the world. 
In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 to 31, it says that wisdom helped create the world. Now, I'm going to tell you why I'm saying that in a moment. And then uh, the last part of chapter 8 is wisdom blesses a man. Proverbs 8 shows the, way, the why and the way of wisdom is the best choice. So it was pretty eye-opening last week when we talked about wisdom creating the world. We used all the verses and showed you all through Scripture how wisdom was there during the creation. Wisdom was created before man. So uh, uh, how wisdom was an eyewitness to uh, that creation, especially the creation of man. How she delighted, the Bible says, she laughed and jumped with joy at God's daily creating and especially of his creating man. It tells us that wisdom was there and she laughed. She jumped. She was excited about God creating wisdom. Now again, it's a personification, obviously, but it's talking about, it's talking about wisdom being a, an essence of God that is there. And so in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30 and 31, it actually tells us a little bit about it. It says, I was the architect at his side. Wisdom's talking. Wisdom saying, I was the architect at God's side. I was his constant delight, rejoicing always in his presence and how happy I was in what he created, his wide world and all the human family. So some people have, have uh, pushed this to say that there's another God, there's a female God called Sophia. And, and Sophia was married to God the Father. That's ludicrous. This has nothing to do with the female God. This has to do with one of the characteristics of God. It's his omniscience. It's his all-knowingness. And so he's giving something. He's going to transfer something to mankind. The Bible says that we're created in, in God's image. The Hebrew word for image there is the word, is the word selim. And it means a phantom copy. If I took, a co if I took my, my hand and I put it on a Xerox machine, on a copying machine, I'm going to get an image of my hand. It's a two-dimensional image. It's of a three-dimensional hand, three hand. That's the same thing. We're in the image of God. God means we have some characteristics of God, but not all the characteristics. We're like a copy. And so that's what that word selah means. So what's happening is we're seeing something transferred here. We're seeing wisdom on the site, and God's alerting us to that, telling Solomon about it, that it's on the site. So we see uh, that this is really pretty much what's going on. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? In chapters 8 and 9, divine wisdom is personified. It's given divine attributes. She's described in a similar way Jesus is. Matter of fact, there's a very close parallel. The Bible says that all things were created by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of man. That's John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. We'll read it for you in a moment. Wisdom cries out because she wants to be heard. She must be heard because that's a matter of life and death for men and women. She's absolutely trustworthy, Proverbs 8, 1 to 21 says. And acquiring her is more worthy than worldly wealth. Proverbs 8, 10 to 11. And I told you this last week. I, I brought in a stack, and I told you I had a $100 bill. You saw the $100 bill in the front, $100 bill in the back. I asked you how much it was. It was an inch. I remember mobsters up in the, up in the uh, um, I came from Hazleton, Pennsylvania. It was Mafia City. Uh, my family wasn't in it, but a lot of my uncles were. And I remember their sayings, a pinch, an inch. An inch, an inch of $100 bills. An inch of $100 bills, I brought them last week, uh, was $23,900. And of course, I showed it to everybody and they wondered where I got all that money from. Then I revealed that it was just uh, two $100 bills with ones in the middle of it. Uh, it was only $300. But uh, basically, this is what this says. Wisdom is greater than any type of money you can have, than fine gold, than fine silver. So if I went out in the middle of uh, downtown Birmingham, um, close to dusk, and I was telling people that I had three bags full of $100 bills, how long do you think I'd have those bags of $100 bills? Not very long. But if I went out there and I said, I have some bags of wisdom and have scripture verses in them, how long do you think I'd have them? Trust me, I'd still have them. But that's not what Solomon says. He says, this is greater than any money you can get. And a matter of fact, when he prayed, when, he, when God said, what do you want? And he, got, and he prayed, he said, I want wisdom. And God said, because you've asked for wisdom, I will give you money. And, and I will give you wealth, and I will give you fame, and I will give you posterity. So wisdom is our key, and that's why we're teaching about, about Proverbs. As we continue on tonight, uh, wisdom links us back to Jesus. Here's the verse I quoted you. Uh, it says this, uh, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without Him was not anything made that was made. It goes on to say, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And it then goes on to say, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light. But he came to bear witness of that light, that through, G, through John, all men might believe in Christ. And so that's John chapter 1, I think, to verse 11. Uh, what it's talking about is Jesus is there at creation. It says all things were created through him. Now you can see the parallel of wisdom in Christ. Again, wisdom is a personification. I know we have it as a female, but trust me, it's a personification of what's going on here. Not, it isn't Jesus, but it's showing you that, that relationship to Jesus being also full of wisdom, which the Bible says he was. How many are getting this? All right, so... As we continue on last week, we concluded that it's not, 
it's not God that needs wisdom. He doesn't need wisdom. But he created it especially for us. He literally took a part of his, uh, of his omniscient nature and separated from himself so we can tap into it. So when we have the word of God, the word of God is a life source to us. It is our way, it's our word of truth. It is our, it is our infallible word of truth. I believe the word of God is infallible. If the word of God is not infallible, then you show me something that is infallible. You show me some, some holy book or some, some treatise or somebody's, somebody's words that's infallible. And I'm going to tell you something. Make them your God and listen to them. And people have. They've listened to Buddha. They've listened to Muhammad. Yet all those things goes against our nature. We know that the word of God is infallible. The Bible says it about itself. That it's our authoritative rule, Timothy says, of faith and conduct. My rule of conduct is not Cheryl, though she helps me at times. My rule is not some rule over America. My rule of faith and conduct is the word of God. What does the word of God say? That's the key. And by the way, it's, it, to me, it's impeccable. Uh, that word has never st stirred me wrong. Um, so the question is, how can we tap into it? Uh, Kings, and above all, everyone else, King Solomon did just that. Uh, I, w I showed you some of the things King Solomon said about wisdom. Let me just go over those briefly for you. He said this, you must labor for it. And God will give it to you if you ask him for it. Even though that sounds like it's a controversy, it's not. You ask him, and so he'll give you a passion for it, and then you labor to get it through reading the word. It may show you things you didn't want to know. Wisdom shows me things I don't want to know. Let me give you an example. I came from a rough and tough family. I came from a, a terrible background. I was doing a funeral on Friday, and uh, I did the funeral. When I walked into the, into the funeral home, um, <clears throat> the uh, funeral director one I hadn't seen before, I know almost all of them, because I've done so many funer funerals, came up to me and said, Pastor Mark, Pastor Mark, I didn't even greet the family yet. He says, I need to talk to you. Can I just have a minute? And I said, well, sure. He introduced himself to me. His first name was Trey. And he said, uh, uh, you don't know me, he said, but um, I lived in Pennsylvania, he says, and I was part of the Warlock Motorcycle Gang. Well, that was the gang that I got saved from, the Warlock Motorcycle Gang. And so he obviously said, and my eyes are about this big, and he said, uh, I've heard of you, he says, and I knew that you were in the South, I knew that you were a preacher, that you had turned your life over, he said, and uh, I, I wanted to meet you, and I knew that I was in Birmingham, and you were in Birmingham. He says, I followed it through, obviously, some probably aged warriors, uh, motorcycle warriors, warlocks, were sitting around their, their whatever it was and talking about guys that have come through. And he said, uh, I've given my, my, told me this horrible story, what he went through in drugs in his life and suicide of his fiance and... Uh, said that uh, he went to a program, and in the program, he said, I always thought I wanted to meet you, but I didn't know how to get in touch with you. He said, I knew that you were in Birmingham somewhere. He said, I went to this program, a 12-step program. He said, and they were giving out your book, Harley to Heaven, where I talked about warlocks and talked about being part of it. And he said, uh, I got saved, he says, and now I'm in a work, really, work program to become a mortician. And he hugged me and told me he wanted to thank me. <clears throat> I, could hardly, I could hardly even do that funeral. I was blown away so much. And uh, so I think of this, and I think of some of the things that are going on, and I think about it, it may show you things you didn't want to know. I didn't want to know about God when I was a warlock. I didn't want to know about, about turning the other cheek. I lived for fighting. You said the wrong thing to me, I fought you. I, I, I made sure that you didn't walk away. And so I didn't want to know you turned the other cheek. And I remember telling Cheryl that when I got saved. Uh, there was a guy bothering me at work, and I was just saved, and people have heard me say this before. And uh, <clears throat> when you fight a lot, like I did back then, you could tell if you could take somebody just by looking at them. And so this guy, I mean, I could eat him for lunch. And so uh, he kept bothering me, kept teasing me. And uh, man, I was, a, I was a fighter. So I told Cheryl, I said, I'm saved, Cheryl, but I'm telling you what, I'm going to take him out in the parking lot tomorrow, and he's not going to get up. And she said to me, she said, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. And he, she says, it's not scripture. I said, I found a scripture. Freely you have received, now freely give. <laughs> I said, I'm doing it. And she said, Mark, you can't do it. And, you know, it was harder for me not to hit him than it was for me to hit him. And so that wasn't something I wanted to do. My emotions didn't want me to do that as a young Christian. But wisdom told me, obviously, not to do it. And God used Cheryl for the wisdom. And so it'll do that for you. It'll give you wisdom. This one says it's, it is a defense for life. It gives us strength. It gives you an interpretation of the events of life. And it stops when you die. Wisdom does not continue on. Also... It is many times unappreciated by those who hear it. I could tell wisdom. I could stand in Congress today and give them wisdom. I'll tell you what, they'll laugh at me and throw me out. And that's okay. Uh, Jesus gave a lot of wisdom. Not everybody followed Jesus. The whole of Israel didn't get saved when Jesus was there. Um, it is better than weapons of mass destruction. I would not trade my wisdom that I've learned in the Word for anything on the planet. Nothing. It has helped me and it's helped others. 
The reason I counsel is not because of my great counseling ability, it's because of the wisdom that I've learned through scripture. Also, it is ruined by a little folly. That's why I have to be really careful because basically I want to, I want to peddle wisdom. I don't want to be foolish. There's a lot of things that are expedient for me, but I can't do them because I don't want people to, to I don't want to discount my, my wisdom by doing something that's foolish. Uh, it's, it directs us in life. So that's what we talked about last week. Now, tonight, we start to conclude our study of wisdom, lady wisdom, she's called. Like the final act in a drama, chapter 9 of Proverbs rehashes the major differences between lady wisdom her complete, and her complete opposite of what we call dame or madam folly. Chapter 9 is a verbal envelope, as you will see. It begins and ends with a call to eat. And how many of you like to eat? Only four of us like to eat. Um, how many of you like to eat? So it's a call to eat. Uh, here's what we find out in chapter 9. It is life's choices in print. And chapter 9 sums it all up. In chapter 9, we'll learn five important things about wisdom and folly. And again, I'm giving you some preps before I start. Wisdom and folly vie for our human allegiance. Tonight, you're going to have choices. Maybe when you go home to use wisdom or use folly. Tomorrow, you're going to have the same choices. The next day, you're going to have the same choices. Just because you choose wisdom, as I said before, one time, doesn't mean you're always going to choose wisdom. You're going to have a choice. And so there's a lot of things we, we, uh, that buy for us. But wisdom and folly is constantly talking to us, calling to us. The ultimate choice lies with us, to which call we answer and with whom we choose to eat. Scoffers can be so hardened in their choice that they do harm to the teacher who challenges them. I teach a lot of people. And let me tell you something. Not just the guy that came back today that was a little critic, and that's fine. I've had people heckle me. I've had people stand up in preaching assignments and preaching things I've done and, and, and come at me. And let me tell you something. It's not me. I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody while I'm preaching. But basically, if you want to continue to listen to folly, you're going to hurt the teacher. You're going to try to hurt the teacher. It goes a little bit further. The wise are so open to wisdom's call that even her rebuke will spark their affection. I don't mind being rebuked by God. I think it's pretty neat when God says, Mark, you can't do that, and slaps my hands. I think it's wonderful. It means that he loves me. The Bible says, whom God loves, he chastises. So wisdom will actually rebuke us. How many have ever did something, you're a Christian, you've done something, and you knew it wasn't the wise thing to do? And you had to go and ask for forgiveness to someone. That's, that's a rebuke. And so that's wisdom. It's the people that can't ask forgiveness that are, are foolish. They don't have any wisdom. Uh, to heed follies call us to forsake the land of the living and to join the company of the dead. That's what Solomon says. If you want to, if you want to uh, do folly and do your own thing, basically you're, you're assigning yourself a death warrant. Uh, so it's pretty heavy duty. Okay, so let's begin. Wisdom's wholesome invitation. This is the, char this is the, uh, the outline. Wisdom's wholesome invitation. We'll do that tonight. And here you go. It's Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. Uh, let me read it for you. Let me read you at least verse 9 three. the lady wisdom is always prepared here's what it says in 9 1 to 3 wisdom has built her house she's hewn out seven pillars she's slaughtered her meat she's mixed her wine she's also furnished her table she has sent out her maidens she cries out from the highest places of the city so wisdom is inviting you to a feast that's what it's saying the position here and uh, the uh, posture here in the picture here is of a great feast like a, bank, a barbecue at an antebellum mansion or like a feast that you would have at a wedding or a religious gathering. So wisdom saying, I have spread out a table for you. And that table is full. I'm getting hungry just looking at that. I have spread out a table for you. I want you to come and eat. You've seen it when you've done it in, uh, in any type of weddings. Uh, it's a banquet hall. She's saying, come on, I have something. I'm prepared. It's not like you have to go search for something. It's going to be furnished for you. If you, have, if you need an answer, it's there for you. He's giving us an analogy, and it's a pretty powerful analogy. Uh, does it ring a bell? Does this feast ring a bell to you? Does, does the invitation to come and dine ring a bell to you? How about a New Testament bell? Does it tell you something like this? Uh, because that's all, that's all in uh, purple. Seven pillars in the house of wisdom. So I'm not going to read that for you. I'll just tell you what it says. She set up her house and there's these seven pillars. It does ring a bell. It rings a bell of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember that one? The marriage supper of the Lamb, the feast of the Lamb. And how about, how about what Jesus said to us when Jesus talked about, about that's not the marriage feast. How about when Jesus, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. How about when Jesus said that uh, go to the, the byways and the highways and bring people in, invite them into the gospel, which is obviously the wisest thing you can do in your life. The picture of a house of seven pillars seems to fit more of a shrine or a temple setting than a family dwelling. I'm 
going to show you those seven pillars later on. The seven pillars of wisdom will also be the seven pillars of making wise decisions. And I'll show it to you later on. But let me just give you a little bit more of what's going on here. It looks like Revelation chapter, chapter 4, verse 5, seven lamps of fire. This number seven is pretty important. That's why I'm giving you this. Uh, let me tell you what it's, it's talking about. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is Isaiah chapter 11. It says the Spirit, there's seven of them. Spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So from the Spirit of the Lord, that's who's going to rest upon the Messiah. There's seven spirits that are going to rest upon the Messiah. Uh, Isaiah 11 too. So we see this number seven everywhere. And I want to just sidetrack for a second because this is what's called numerology. We know that seven is used all over Scripture. What does it mean? Well, we know that there's Isaiah 11 too. The Messiah will have the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel. Uh, he will have Ruah, Yahweh, might, knowledge, and fear of Yahweh. So uh, we know that the that Jesus will have these seven spirits. We know that there's there's a, one of that one of those spirits is wisdom. It's actually the first one. And so we'll see that wisdom is included in this number seven. Also, the number seven means perfection in Scripture. So what is the significance of the number seven in the Bible? Well, here it is. Seven. Seven is symbolic of a totality of perfection and completion. The number of seven appears to be the number of perfection since the earth was created in seven days. Well, regards to the fact that God rested on the seventh day. Rest is still doing something and the seventh day is a day of rest. And we're told to work six days and rest on the seventh. Seven is symbolic of a totality of perfection or completeness like the seven day week. Seven notes in a scale. You will see seven everywhere in God's creation. It's all over the place. Matter of fact, if you look at fowl, if you look at ducks and geese, and you look at chickens, they have gestation periods of multiples of seven. Seven days, 21 days, 28 days. And so God has put it everywhere. Uh, you'll see seven all over the place. You'll see it a lot. Uh, and this is the numerology in scripture. If you want to know what numbers mean in scripture, they mean something. One is unity, new beginnings. Two is division and witnessing. Three, divine completeness and perfection. Four, creation, the world, creative works. Four winds, four, four directions, grace, God's goodness, Pentateuch. Our five books, weakness of man is six, manifestation of evil, sins of Satan, or evils of Satan. Seven, resurrection, spiritual completion, and father's perfection. I'll stop right there. These are the primary numbers that are used in scripture just to give us a bunch of understanding. You'll see seven all over the book of Revelation. Why? Because Revelation is the end. It's a perfected end. Seven spirits of God, seven seals of the book, seven golden candlesticks, seven stars in Christ's heaven, seven angels of the churches, seven letters to the churches, seven eyes, seven horns of the lamb, seven mountains, seven thunders, seven kings, seven angels with trumpets, seven angels with vials, seven heads and crowns of the dragons. So this number is all over there. It's a finality of, and we'll see the perfection of God. So notice the uh, reference to Jesus in these in these charts that I showed you, that, that, that chart of wisdom. So the, what are the seven pillars of wisdom's house? Well, I'll tell you that at the end. Right now, I want to tell you just a little bit more about this. This is, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. So wisdom calls to a banquet. Forget our pillars for a moment, we'll bring you back there. You're going through the pillars of wisdom and you're going to eat something. Those pillars mean something, I'm saving them tip for you, but you're going to eat some more wisdom. So it's, a, it's just like this table that is set in front of your enemies that Psalm tells us. So if you want to overcome in your world and in your life, and you want to overcome problems in your life, any enemy that comes at you is a problem, obviously, uh, then you need to banquet at wisdom's table. Now, in, as we continue to go on, I want you to know uh, it was written, that's written by a sheep's viewpoint, by the way, by a sheep, by David. Listen to what uh, Proverbs continues to say in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. Who so is simple, let him turn in hither, come into the house, come through the pillars, come to eat. As for him that wants understanding, she says to him, come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. So she's inviting you to a feast. Wisdom saying, listen, if you don't understand a problem, if you have some need, you need an answer to something, come on through the seven pillars, come into my house, and uh, I will feed you. I will show you what to eat. So uh, it's pretty powerful when you look at it. It's powerful. It's a commune, it means commune with God. Wisdom's telling us, if you're going to eat sp spiritually, forget about yoga, forget about transcendental meditation, Forget about New Age crystals. Forget about humanism. Forget about having it your way. All those things are trying to get people to have some higher power. They're trying to get them to have some wisdom. In Sedona, California, how many of you have ever been to Sedona, California? The New Age capital of the world. I, if you're ever in Arizona, you need to go there. Uh, in Arizona, if, if you pass Flagstaff and you go to Sedona, uh, you, will see, uh, you will see huge crystals outside of every single establishment. They're collecting sunlight so that they can have an aura of power and wisdom. So people go around them and they stand by them during the sunlight. 
You want to talk about being foolish? That's pretty foolish. Um, I'd rather have a big Bible open and me read it uh, instead of going by a crystal. So we know that those things don't bring us wisdom, but only God's word brings us wisdom. So it's saying, eat at my table, eat at God's table. Now, what do you think you would find at God's table to eat? Do you think you'd just find ice cream and cake? Now we're going to get into nitty gritty. The things you want? I don't think so. Just steak? Nope. You're going to find peas and carrots and lima beans. You're going to find everything. Here's the problem with Christianity today. It says this, forsake the foolish and live and go the way of understanding. So if you are a nutritionist today or a health expert, this is the food groups. This is what's going to keep you healthy. You need six to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. You're going to need two, four servings of fruit. You're going to need three to five servings of vegetables, two to three servings of milk, yogurt, and cheese, two to three servings of meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, eggs, and nuts. And then you're going to need fats and oils and sweets sparingly. So if you want to be healthy, you don't want to get this upside down. You don't want to put all the fats and the oils and the sweets down here. Because if you do that, you're going to die early. You, may, you have a lot of sugar, you're going to die early. So why do we, if the Bible tells us to eat wisdom, how am I going, where am I going with this, right? If the Bible tells us to eat wisdom, then what wisdom do you need to eat? We need to eat all of God's word. The problem with America today is we're fat on spiritual candy. We're hearing only what we want to hear. We're taking from scriptures, from pulpits, only the things that make us feel good. I hate peas. I hate peas. When I was a kid, I hated vegetables. But you need vegetables. How many of you know that? You need them. How many of you know that? All right, good. So, wisdom's telling you the same thing. She's giving you a diet. So what does God's word tell us? It doesn't tell us to feed only on the, good, on the, on the things that, that feel, feel good for us, only the sweet things. You're living in an America that has a progressive Christianity right now that's only feeding Christians sweet things. That's all they're feeding. We don't want to hear about, we don't want to hear about sin. We don't want to hear about, about judgment. We don't, want to hear, we, don't want to have any, we don't want to hear anything at all that's not sweet and tastes good. And so we are upside down. Yep. Prayer, praise, worship, and pleasant situations is our God link. Difficult situations and enemies, you need, you need enemies. Whether you know that or not, you need them. They sharpen you. Difficult situations make you stronger. I ran the hurdles when I was in high school. And let me tell you something, they were the hardest things to run, especially for kids that are in high school. And there was something you called getting steps. Getting a step is between the high hurdles, you had to get three steps before the next hurdle. Lower hurdle, seven steps before. It was an art. If you got those steps, everybody was in the distance. You, you'd make all kinds of records. But when I finally got my steps in about 11th grade, I was winning every track meet that I, I, uh, that I was being placed in. Why? Because I, was, I, found some, I found a secret to winning those steps. Let me tell you what I got, what, how I got there, though. I had bruises all over my knees from knocking over hurdles for a year and a half. My knees were swollen most of the time. But those, those difficult situations helped me to run those hurdles. Your difficult situations in life help you to run the race of life. I would not erase them from any of us because it's part of it. It's trusting God. Family and close relationships, fellowships and friendship, that's our group therapy. Uh, uh, sickness, strife and gossip, no testimony without a test. Praise, health and well-being are witness to others. Uh, would we ever have a Paul without him going through any of this? Rejection, hurt, depression, and anger. And so, yes, we have, God mostly gives us some pleasant things, but those rest of that is for our benefit. This is wisdom tells you, you're going to go through this. You know, the Bible says you will go through certain, certain situations. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. I'd like to tell you that nothing bad is ever going to happen to people who are saved, but that's a lie from the enemy. The great thing about it is that God can one, can one over the enemy. How many are with me? So how many are following it tonight for a moment? So... Verse 5 is pretty powerful. Verse 6 is powerful. It wisdom tells us if you want to live, verse 6, it means if you want to accept the gift of life, you're going to have to learn how to eat the right combinations of things from God's table. Wow. American Christianity is loading up on ice cream today, and I'm concerned about American Christianity. And I wisdom says we'll teach you how to do just that. So, can we all live on just ice cream and of life? By the way, I made that chart up for you. How necessary are difficulties in our walk of life? Well... Let me give you just a little bit. Luke says this, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistrust you. Now anybody who can sit here, who misuse you, anybody who can sit here and tell me that that's easy is, is not really telling me the truth. How many of you ever been hurt by someone? How many of you ever been hurt by somebody in a church? You know what most people do when they get hurt by somebody in a church? They run to another church. And you know what they get in the other church? Somebody's going to hurt them. <laughs> and then they're going to run to another church and somebody's going to hurt them there. People hurt each other. So that's part of life. Us getting over that is really a wisdom. When you, can, when you can pray for an enemy, 
I mean, seriously, pray for them. Not God get them, not that kind of prayer. But pray blessings. You ever pray, how many have ever prayed for a blessing on your enemy? I have. It's liberating. Trust me, it is very liberating. So, the question wisdom, po wisdom posed for us th is this. Are you able? Can you digest life situations with my, without my help? Do you need my help? Will you eat at my table even if you encounter something on that table that you don't like? Will you accept the mixed, fr the mixed food of life at my table and live? Proverbs 9, 6. The Hebrew word there is chana. It means to come back to life. Here's what it is. Before I get, forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of, the, of understanding. It's Proverbs 9, 6. Here's the word. It's the word shok shokma. Excuse me. The fear of the Lord. Inseparable from relationship to the source. It means skill. When you hear the word skill in Proverbs, it's skill at living your life, which requires knowledge, understanding, and volition to act on it. Life in Proverbs is uh, existence in God's presence according to his design. They're both translated from shokma, which is your happiness, contentment, and fulfillment. Shokma is God's skill at creation and man's skill at living. God created us with a skill, with a wisdom, with a knowledge, and he wants us to live in that wisdom and in that knowledge. So it's a pretty powerful back and forth, if you will. Wisdom is finishing up what she is, she is in Proverbs chapter 9. She's telling us about those seven pillars of wise decision making. I'm closing soon. Uh, what her house is built on. And so the, here they are. I want you to know that uh, she also tells us, well, she tells us this. If you need to make a decision, number one, be guided by God's word. This is the first pillar. Be guided by God's character. What would God do? What would Jesus do? Be guided by Jesus' example. Be guided by what is right, not possible consequences. You know, you know the reason why people lie? I'll tell you why they lie. Um, my grandson is a tremendous little boy. But every now and then he'll lie. And you know why he'll lie? Same reason why we lie. To avoid, to avoid any of the consequences. We lie because we know what people are going to think if we tell them the truth and we know they're not going to like it. Well, this says this. Be guided by what is right, not by possible consequences. Be guided by biblical standards rather, rather than bi by biblical stories. That's a big, important statement. Biblical stories may give you the, the crux of what's happening, but there's standards that are there. You can't just take a story of the, of the she-bears coming out of the woods and killing, and, uh, and killing the kids that were, that were making fun of Elijah as something you should pray for. That's a biblical story, but it's not a standard. Here, be guided by the principles of love. Love is our key, and be guided by God's law. Wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. You do those things, then you can enter in, and now the feast is going to be, is going to be, going to be shown to you. And feast, the feasting of things at God's table, and there it is. That's what, he'll, that's what will be shown to you. So, and our ability to take, through wisdom, to take the good and the bad in life with wisdom for our spiritual health. In closing, the toughest truths to learn, and one that wisdom indirectly tells us, is that God will even... Turn our wounds into wisdom. I am much wiser now, not because of just reading scripture, but because of going through certain things in my life that have wounded me. I couldn't use some wisdom in my enemies if I didn't have enemies. Those enemies wounded me. And same with you. And so wisdom tells me I've overcome that wound. I know a ton of people that carry wounds all through their life. It's baggage. They have a chip on their shoulder all through life. And they never get over a problem. That's not wisdom, that's folly. And so let me just give you a couple more things tonight as you're here as I close. Which leads me to four ways to walk like Lady Wisdom. Four ways. Number one, stay on your knees. A wise woman walks with reverence and respect. Her life is a worshipful offering to God. Start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses out with such wisdom and learning. If you humble yourself, if we humble ourselves, that is the first key to, that's the first key to wisdom's truths. You know, before I was saved, I was an extremely proud person. I, wouldn't, I was not humble at all. And, I, and basically, I didn't even know what the word, how you could spell the word. And now in my life, I want to live to try to be as humble as I possibly can because it opens up things to me. Secondly, savor the truth. Lady Wisdom has no taste for worldly fare. You are, not in, you are in the world, you're not of it. Her, pur, her pure palate fills her mouth with common sense and discernment. Do you hear Lady Wisdom calling? Can you hear Madam Insight raising her voice? My mouth shoes. Choose and savors and relishes truth. I can't stand the taste of evil. Proverbs 8. Yield to authority. Submission characteriz characterizes the life of a wise woman. She's an obedient follower. And again, it's only talking about women here, but you can generalize and put it to men also. A wise heart takes orders. An empty head will come unglued. That's Proverbs chapter 10, verse 8 in the message. Keep your ears perked up. 
Lady Wisdom has a teachable spirit. She considers life in her schoolroom and is always adjusting her understanding based on the tutelage of her master teacher. Let me give you an example of that that you're not, some of you are not going to accept or like, but I'm going to tell it to you, and you can disagree with me. It's okay. When I first got saved, and capital punishment, for example, came up, I, every pastor I ever knew, every person that was Christian I knew, agreed with capital punishment and said, yes, if somebody does something horrendous and they're sentenced to death, they need to, they need to kill them. And boy, it sounded like the thing to do until I started thinking about it years later. Because I was teaching it. Years later, I started thinking about it. I'm totally against capital punishment. Totally. Because I couldn't see Jesus killing anybody. I can't see... Now, I'm, now I don't... If, the, if, the, if my society does it, that's up to them. But if you told me... Really, to believe in something, you should be able to carry it out. So if you told me... Uh, if you said, I believe in capital punishment, then put yourself in the, in the position to push the button in an electric chair. Could you do that? If you couldn't do that, you don't believe in capital punishment. Believing in it means you can act it. So uh, I couldn't see myself acting and sending... Why couldn't I? Well, what if the person was guilty? I'm sending them to hell by doing that. What if they weren't? So I changed my views on it. I went to my pastor and told him. He says, oh, you don't understand scripture. I said, I, wrote, I told him the scripture. I says, I should be able to be teachable. And God's taught me that I, I need mercy and I need love. Even though something's heinous, I don't have to pull that out. I don't have to do that. A society may have to do that. But I don't have to consciously do that, and I'm certainly not going to preach it because I don't see Jesus ever preaching about capital punishment. I, I see him about, about allowing Barabbas to be loosed. I see him about forgiving his enemies. How many are with me tonight? Now, that doesn't mean you have to have the same opinion as me. I'm just saying we need to stay teachable. And so just in case you, you uh, get in trouble this week or next, I'm going to give you some emergency numbers to call, okay? Because I don't want to leave you helpless tonight. I know that wisdom is there. I know you have lots of needs. I know a lot of us, a lot of people ask me, Pastor, what do I do here? So I'm going to give you some emergency numbers. Uh, one of them is Wayne's, one of them is Cheryl's, and one of them is Andy's. No, here, here's, your, here's your emergency numbers. When in sorrow, call John 14. When you have sinned, call Psalm 51. When you worry, call Matthew 6, 19 to 34. When you're in danger, call Psalm 91. When you feel, when your faith needs stirring, Hebrews 11. When you feel down and out, Romans 8, 31. When you want peace and rest, Matthew 11, 25 to 30. When the world seems bigger than God, Psalm 90. If your pockets are empty, Psalm 37. When you're lonely, lowly and fearful, Psalm 23. When you grow bitter, bitter and critical, 1 Corinthians 13. For how to get along with other men, Romans 12. If you're depressed, Psalm 27. If people seem unkind, John 15. Those are things that you can, those are some numbers for you to call, some emergency numbers. Now, why are they there? Because every single one of them are wisdom in dealing with some problem in life. And that's what we've been talking about. So, lastly, remember this. I am God. Today I'll be handling all your problems. Please remember that I do not need your help. If the devil or your ego happens to deliver a situation to you that you cannot handle, do not attempt to resolve it. Kindly put it in the SFJTD, something for Jesus to do box. It will be addressed in my name, not yours. In my time, not yours. Once the matter is placed into the box, do not hold on to it or attempt to remove it. Holding on or removing will delay the res resolution of your problem. If it is a situation that you think you are capable of handling, please consult me in prayer to be sure that it is the proper resolution. Because I do not need sleep nor I don't slumber, there is no need for you to lose any sleep. It says what? Rest, my child. If you need to contact me, I'm only a prayer away. That's some pretty good wisdom for all of us. So would you bow your heads tonight for a moment? So I asked when everybody came in, how many are having a good week? And you were very honest. A lot of you were very honest. And then it's one of the worst weeks, Pastor Mark. I've had a pretty bad week. So if that was you, t and uh, you're feeling a little bit better that God's going to give you an answer to, your, to not just last week, but the problems that come up, I just want you to raise your hand for a moment. Thank you. Hands all over the place. So let's just pray. Father, again, we thank you tonight. And Lord, I thank you for your wisdom. Though we're teaching it, Lord God, we must apply it. And tonight, Lord God, let us think about next time we make a decision going through those seven pillars. Let us think about every single one of those pillars, Lord God. And that, just that alone, will bring us to a spot of, of feasting at wisdom's table. And let us think, oh God, about what we need to do to walk in wisdom, Lord. I just pray tonight that you continue to bless us. I know as you open up your word next week and you continue in chapter 9 to us, Lord willing, Lord, that you will finally tell us the, the finality of wisdom's call and Lord, and then you will lay out more Proverbs to us that will just take us right down the line of decision-making in life. Bless families tonight, Lord God. Bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.